So all children are curious. They're born curious. Children are already exploring the world from within hours after their birth, after they're already looking around. As soon as their eyes can fix, there's actually research showing that if you if you show a child who's just a few hours old, you show them a particular pattern that they can see, and now you give them a choice between looking at that pattern and a new one, they look more at the new one. They're already saying, okay, I got some sense of that, but what about this one over here? They're not consciously saying that, but they're acting as if they're trying to figure out this world that they've just entered. Joining me on the podcast today is Dr. Peter Gray, a highly published research professor of psychology and neuroscience at Boston College. He is one of the world's leading experts on the role of play in human evolution and how children educate themselves through play and exploration when they're free to do so. He is the author of Free to Learn, Why Unleashing the Instinct to Play Will Make Our Children Happier, More Self-Reliant and Better Students for Life, a book that's been translated into over 18 languages. He's also authored a blog of over 200 essays for the website Psychology Today called Freedom to Learn. And Peter is one of the founders of Alliance for Self-Directed Education, the mission of which is to renew children's freedom to play and explore independently of adult control. He is a legend within the homeschool community and a pioneer for human freedom. This is Eyes Wide Open with me, your host, Lawrence Eastman. First, I want to give a big shout out to Cheryl Davis, who very generously made a big contribution to the channel through Locals.com. Thanks, Cheryl. I want to let you know that all the income we generate will be plowed straight back in so I can continue to improve the quality and bring you more content. So if you want to get involved, get over to Locals.com and become a supporter because independent media needs your support. Links in the description below. But now it's time for our guest, Peter Gray. Welcome to the show. Peter Gray, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for accepting my invite. It's a great honor to have you on. Thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Great. The reason how you came into my sphere of view is my son, Donnie, he's six. He attends a self-directed community where we live in Southport in near Liverpool. And he's been attending that for a couple of years now. And he loves it. It's fantastic. He basically goes two days a week, spends most of the day and just plays all day. And he does what's called self-directed education. And within that community, I don't go much. My wife takes him. I didn't, I didn't really know much about it until I was suggested I invite you onto my podcast, especially because of the personal connection that I have with the, with the topic. And I started digging in to your material and it's very persuasive, really persuasive because I had a little bit of resistance before that, before learning about self-directed education, I was kind of in the, the camp of the trivium, the quadrivium, you know, which is still homeschooled or schooling that is different from the schooling we have now, but maybe still a far, far removed from self-directed education. So tell me a little bit about your background and how you found yourself as the go-to guy for self-directed education. So I'm a research professor in psychology and neuroscience at Boston College, have been for half a decade now, no longer teaching, but continuing to do research and a lot of writing. Originally, I was doing more neuroscience. I was studying the way certain hormones attach to certain parts of the brain and the effects that they have on behavior, studying at this in laboratory animals. So I got interested in the topic that I've devoted now most of my career to when my own son was just about the age of your son, or a little bit older, <laughs> and uh, he had been rebelling um, in school for from kindergarten on through fourth grade, continuously rebelling, saying it's prison, saying that he hates to go there, making life very difficult for the teachers. And secondarily to that, difficult for his mother and me. We were constantly being called in <laughs> by, by the school. What are we going to do about this kid who <laughs> won't follow the rules in school and does everything different from the way we're telling them to do it and so on and so forth. And 
Finally, people, if they want to know the details, could read about it in the, in the beginning of my book, Free to Learn, as I won't go into the details. But finally, he convinced us that um, absolutely he was, we were not going to win this battle of keeping him in school. And we didn't know what to do. Homeschooling was not a big deal then. We weren't very equipped for homeschooling anyway. So we found this very radically alternative school called the Sudbury Valley School, just two miles from our home. At that time, that was easy walking distance for kids. And <laughs> so it was no problem. And visited the school. And he said, if this is an illusion, if this is true, this is exactly what a school should be. <laughs> and um, so this was a school where it's called the Sudbury Valley School, as I said. It's a school where if you were to visit it at any time of day, knowing only that it's a school, you would assume that it's recess time and that everybody is on recess. The whole school, the kindergarten, the elementary school, the high school, they're all on recess at the same time. Because what you would see would be kids doing what you would think kids would do when they're free. <laughs> some of them are playing outdoor games. Some of them are climbing trees. Some of them are reading books, but it doesn't look like school books. Some of them are strumming on guitars. Some of them are hanging around just talking to one another. You find all kinds of activities, and it looks like play. It looks like following your own interests. Not much of it looks like school. You might find one kid maybe who's reading a math book, and maybe you would discover that this person is planning on applying to university for the next year, and he needs to pass a math exam in order to get into the university, pass an SAT exam. And so he's preparing himself for that. But other than that, you'd find kids in the kitchen cooking. You'd find kids uh, maybe doing some woodworking. You'd find all these interesting things that people are doing. So that's the school. Children are not segregated from one another. So there's a lot of age mixing going along, along, which became a focus for my later research was the value of age mixing. And so this is what the school is. Well, <laughs> so this is a school for self-directed education. And I was happy that my son was happy. I, the sparkle came back into his eyes. He was the kid I used to know before he ever started school. And a lot of the energy was drained out of him. And so I was very happy about that. And I wasn't actually, to be honest, concerned about his learning. He's always a person who learned. I never was really worried about that. But I was a little concerned about his future. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Like most people in our culture, I at that time, no longer believe it, but at that time believed that if you didn't do school as, you, as it's usually defined, you would be handicapped in life in some ways. You may not be able to go on to higher education. Maybe if you want to become a doctor or a lawyer or something that requires a higher education to do it, maybe you simply can't go on because you haven't met the requirements to get into the university to study these, these things or to get your bachelor's degree to go on to study these things. So I was concerned about that. I was also a little bit concerned, I have to say, about this whole idea of self-directed education that, and this is, you know, this is kind of what I hear from a lot of people today. Other people have the same concern I had then, which is, well, how do you get interested? How do you find out really what you're interested in? Maybe all that people become interested in is music and art because that's so obvious and that's kind of, we all sort of believe that's intrinsically interesting to people, but most of us don't believe that other things are intrinsically interesting. You have to kind of develop this interest to be trained into this interest. So, so I had a little bit of a worry, you know, that uh, are the graduates of this school kind of all starving artists and musicians or living in their parent basements or, you know, and I didn't want that. Yeah, my wife thought that would be okay, but I didn't. Want it. <laughs> so that's so this. I find actually that men, that husbands and wives tend to differ on this. That wives tend to be more intuitively understanding of this, and if the kid is happy, I'm happy. Dads, on average, I, I don't want to stereotype the difference too much, but on average, I think dads, like you and I, are a little more concerned. Am I going to have to support this kid his whole life? Or, you know, so we want to make sure he's going to make a living, mm -hmm. he or she. So I, the end result of all of that was that I did a study of the graduates. I first tried to get other people to do a study of the graduates who, for whom it would be more in their field, but I couldn't interest anybody. So I finally did a study of the graduates. This is a long time ago, but this school was founded in 1968. It had already been in existence long enough to have 
about 100 people that I categorize as graduates. They'd been there for at least two or three years. They had been out for at least a couple of years. So, And some of them, about a quarter of them, had done all of their education at the school, kindergarten, what would be called kindergarten through high school in a school that divides people up that way. And so I did this study of the graduates with the help of a person who was a part-time staff member who became a collaborator on the research. David Chanoff is his name. We identified most of them and most of them responded to a long survey that we gave them about what they were doing now as adults, what their retrospections were about their time at the school, whether they liked being at the school and so on. And what we found, which eventually published in the American Journal of Education, convinced me that I don't have to worry about the things I was worried about. They had gone on into the whole range of careers. There were some very successful musicians and artists, as it turned out. And <laughs> so there well, was plenty of musicians and artists, though, yeah. And there was a disproportionate number. There were more musicians and artists than from a typical school, but there were people in every realm. There were people in academia, there were people in human services, there were people who had started businesses. And so it became clear to me that this was not apparently inhibiting the life of people. Those people who want, and this was the biggest surprise to me, those people who wanted to go on to higher education, what it, what it, the U.S. is called going on to college and the U.K. is called going on to university. That's right. They had no problems. Those who wanted to go on, get on in. I mean, here, you know, we all believe that you have to take certain courses. You have to have a high school diploma, a legitimate high school diploma. You have to go through all this in order to get admitted into the college or university. And these people had done none of that. And yet they were going on to higher education. They somehow got in. And once in, they did fine. They claim not to be handicapped at all by virtue of not knowing supposedly what the other kids were supposed to know as a result of going through a standard high school curriculum. None of them, in a response to a question, said that they regretted having gone to such an unusual school. Most of them said they were very glad they had gone, and the others said they were glad in response to a four-choice question. When we asked them why they were glad about it, the answers tended to be that Number one, I really enjoyed my childhood. <laughs> this is something we shouldn't neglect. We parents sometimes think that, you know, it's all about training for adulthood, but childhood is a big part of life. <laughs> it's mm. pretty important to enjoy your childhood, right? But in addition, they talk about, I've learned how to learn. I learned I can learn anything I want to know anytime I want to know it. So I'm not worried about that. I learned how to take control of my own life. So one of the advantages I've had as an adult, whether it's in the work world or in higher education, is I know how to take responsibility for myself. I know what I want and I know how to go to it. I know how to control myself. I don't go out drinking before an exam the way some of my <laughs> classmates do. I don't, you know, I, I have grown up learning how to control myself and I am good at controlling myself. A lot of them also talked about their social skills. At the school, they spend a lot of time socializing and at this school, there's no hierarchical distinction between adults and children. So they grow up not afraid of people who are older than them. They grow up being able to look an authority figure and the so-called authority figure in the eye and talk to that person as if this is a real person. We're having a real conversation. So they found that this kind of a skill was valuable, both in the work world and in the university world. They weren't afraid of approaching professors and having discussions with them and, and sharing their ideas and challenging the professor's ideas, things that the typical undergraduate student wouldn't think of doing because, after all, this person is so much higher than I am on the mm. totem pole. So they aren't thinking that way. And it turns out that it turns out to be valuable not to think that way in mm. our culture today, at least in segments of it, that's true. So that was the that was the nature of the study. I should probably back up and say a little bit more about the school. What do, what do I mean when I say it's a school for self-directed education? What I really mean is there's absolutely no curriculum. Nobody is setting out less to be learned. There's no tests. <laughs> you know, there's nobody even urging as part of the philosophy of the school. The staff members don't even try to encourage you to learn something that they, that somebody might think you should be learning at this point. So let's say you reach eight or nine years old and you're not reading yet. Nobody at the school is saying, well, don't you think you should start learning to read? Nobody's doing that. 
the assumption is when you're ready to learn to read, you'll learn to read. And maybe if you want help, you'll ask for help, but it's up to you to decide to do that. So it truly is the responsibility of the child to direct their own education at this setting. I mean, it sounds so radical, but it's only so radical because it's contrasted with the existing structure at the moment, which is forced compulsory schooling. And we're meant to believe that homeschooling is the experiment, right? But it's reality is it's the public schooling is the experiment. We've been homeschooling for hundreds of thousands of years. And it's, you know, the, the experiment that's being run by the state and the government, which isn't doing very well. Uh, and I think that's one of the main reasons we're seeing so much, you know, uh, such a rise in homeschooling at the moment. In terms of my own particular story is that I was, I was expelled from two state schools for being disruptive or for challenging the authority or for having a rebellious spirit. And I knew from a, an early age that school was not the place for me. The options were very limited. And I remember at junior schools, one before high school, that was pretty fun because there was lots of play. But a high school or, you know, senior school, we call it, was just a nightmare. I hated it. It was, it was just a total prison. And the school itself was surrounded by a really large nine foot metal fence with spikes on. <laughs> and that's not to keep people out, it's to keep the kids in, you know. So I always knew that there was something inherently wrong about the state schooling system. And as I've grown older, I've, I've come to realize, well, actually it's an indoctrination camp. It's not there to educate us or enlighten us or take us on this you know, journey to find ourselves and discover our potential and reach our destiny. No, it's actually there to squash the human spirit and to create worker drones, if you like, for whatever the, the system is that is currently dominant. You've written really lucidly and so clearly about the history of education. Could you give us a brief overview of uh, the various stages that we've gone through to bring us to this modern system of forced schooling that we find ourselves in now? So that the self-directed education system is giving more, given more context? Sure. So the, the history of schooling really parallels the history of our understanding of, of children and childhood, what the purpose of childhood is. So I go back in history to pre-agricultural times in my thinking. I'm an evolutionary psychologist and concerned I, I've developed this biological theory of education education that we have evolved these educative instincts that that children are born with that they come into the world burning to learn and to educate themselves and there are certain instincts that promote that behavior so in my interest where how did those instincts come about i got interested in hunter gatherer cultures we were all hunter gatherer cultures through most of human evolution 99% or so of human evolutionary period it's only about 10,000 years ago that agriculture was developed. So it turns out there are some people who managed to survive and as hunter gatherers into the, even into the late 20th century. And there were a lot of anthropologists who went out and made contact with these people in the mid to late 20th century. And I got interested in that literature and ended up along with one of my graduate students doing a survey of anthropologists who had observed such cultures and asking them about children's lives in those cultures, how children learned in those cultures, what the relationship between adults and children was. And so what I found is in every one of these cultures that had been studied, I got pretty much the same story that children from the age of four, when they're typically regarded as no longer infants, no longer needing to be in the immediate presence of adults, from the age of four on through the mid to late teenage years, roughly the ages that we think of as the school ages, children have basically all day long to play and explore in age mixed groups. They often are away from adults and they are free to play and explore. And part of the reason for that is that the hunter-gatherer cultures have an egalitarian philosophy. They don't have hierarchies. 
They don't have bosses and employers. They don't have masters and slaves. Would you say that they are a, a true anarchy in that sense? You could say in that sense that they are a true anarchy. First of all, I should say they live in small bands of roughly 50 people per band, counting the kids. And so within each band is autonomous from any other band. And within the band, decisions are made by consensus, largely long discussions around the campfire, whether it's time to move on, to follow the game, and, and so on and so forth. They really survive by virtue of the fact that they cooperate and share. There's no way of storing food. There's no point in accumulating wealth because accumulating material goods because you're nomadic I mean, following yeah, right, the game. Yeah. You can't, no point owning anything more than you can easily carry on your back mm -hmm. as you go from one place to another. There are some anthropologists who argue differently, but I think the majority would say that these band hunter gathers represent the prominent way of, of human living. So as part of this egalitarianism and sharing, people, there are real taboos about acting like you're a big shot, acting like you know more than other people, acting like you have the right to tell other people what to do. And here's the amazing part of it, even to me, when I first began to hear about it, is they don't even tell children what to do. <laughs> mm. They don't, you know, they literally don't tell children what to do. Children hang around, go to bed when they want to go to bed, and so on and so forth. That, with that's very counter, little children. Th might. That's counter to everything that we've been conditioned to believe currently in the modern world, isn't it? That children need and, constant adult supervision. Right. The belief is by the age of four, children can be trusted. They trust children's instincts. They trust children's judgments and so on and so forth. So the education that's occurring is occurring as the children are playing and exploring. And so one of the things I asked the anthropologists in a survey was, so what did they play at? And it turns out that they played at, not because anybody was forcing them to or even encouraged them to, they played at the kinds of activities that are important to the culture. So in a culture where the men hunt with bows and arrows, the boys played endlessly, tracking, tracking game, tracking, learning how to track. In a culture where the women fish, the girls played at fishing. In one of the cultures, both men and women hunted with bows and arrows, and the girls also played endlessly with bows and arrows. So it, they played at the musical traditions of the culture and inventing new music. They played at the, the art of the culture. They played at building huts. They played at the culture that they uses dugout canoes. They played with dugout canoes and played at building dugout canoes. So it's as if that, and this is consistent with a theory that had already been developed earlier, that children come into the world biologically designed to kind of look around, see what is it that people do in the world I'm growing up in, and to be interested in that, and then to play at that, work it into their play and become skilled at it. So that's how they learn the skills that are important to their culture. So one of the things that kept being emphasized by these anthropologists and also in some of the written writing is that hunter-gatherers value free will. That's almost the essence of it. Your free will is your guide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we value that. The hunter-gatherer way of life requires actually quite a lot of creativity. The adult pasts are very highly highly skilled and highly creative. Hunting is not easy. Gathering isn't either. You have to know where the roots are going to be. You're constantly learning all, all your life. Very different from farming and industry, mm -hmm. where once you've got a lot of labor there, but in farming and industry, you've got a, a lot of so-called unskilled labor. The hunter-gatherer culture requires a fully developed intuition. So that that's right. It, it's more than just uh, mechanical skills. It's being in tune with the environment, which seems counter to what farmers do. You know, that's follow a routine, follow a structure. That's this right. is what we do this day. This is what we do that day. You've got to be ready to innovate. You've got to adapt. You know, there may be a drought. There may be changes. You've got to be, in some sense, able to think and make judgments. And I think that this way of raising children to trust their free will. So they're learning how <laughs> to make their own decisions as they're growing up. So they're developing the kind of responsibility that one needs to be, to be a successful member of that culture. So I wanna continue on now with this history. So what happened then with agriculture? Once agriculture was developed, hmm. 
once we had farming, things began to change. Now you have, first of all, you had sedentary lifestyle. You had people, if you have a farm, you can't really leave it. <laughs> you have to stay mm-hmm. there. Now also an, an advantage of that in some sense is that you can accumulate wealth. You could store stuff. You've got your home, <laughs> right? And yet they have property. Place. Now, hunter-gatherers don't have any sense that anybody owns the land, right? I mean, <laughs> there might be this understanding that our band does most of its hunting and gathering here, and you do yours over there, and so on and so forth. But that doesn't, that's not the same as saying, I as an individual own this property, or even that our band owns this property. Mm. The, the, the land belongs to the God or the world, or you know, however you want to put it, the gods. The land is the land. The land is the earth. It's it'd be silly for a hunter gatherer to think to, to believe that anybody could own property. And within the hunter gatherer band, everything is shared. You share food. You share. The anthropologists would say it's kind of difficult to work in a hunter gatherer band because they'll say, "You've got two shirts. <laughs> Shouldn't you be giving one to somebody else?" I mean. You feel like you're really selfish if you're not sharing everything when you're living in a band like that. It's almost demand sharing. From an evolutionary perspective, why has that type of behavior been selected amongst hunter-gatherers that egalitarian share everything, don't hold property? Because you're survive. Well, first of all, the not holding property is essential because you are necessarily moving around because you've got to follow the available game and vegetation. Once you've used up the and edible things where you are now, you need to move to a new place. Let those things regenerate where you were before. <laughs> Once you have captured the game that's near you and available, you need to move. So you kind of are living in a series of camps. You make shelters at each place. The sharing, it it comes from the fact that this is how you survive. So if you are, if you are a hunter gatherer and you're a family, you, you can't be, you can't guarantee, let's say if you had this classic idea that came later in agriculture, that the husband in the family is the breadwinner. Well, that husband isn't bringing back bread every day, (laughs) right? (laughs) You know, you're, you're out looking for big game, you're lucky if you get one every two weeks or something like that, but somebody else will get it, right? (laughs) And so if you have a system of sharing, that meat doesn't belong to just you or your family. That belongs to the whole band. And it even, by the way, belongs to other bands if they are not doing so well. And you've got relatives in other bands and you are sharing sometimes across bands who are not living right where you are. So this idea that your survival depends upon sharing, it depends upon, and sharing depends upon your getting along with one another and getting along with another depends upon respecting one another and respecting one another means that you're not trying to boss them around. You believe in them. You're allowing them their free will. It with- sounds like a, a decentralized utopia. <laughs> No, we're all talking at the moment, aren't we, about the solution to the problems we have is decentralization, decentralization. And it seems as if that's the model that's already existed or that we're already designed to flourish under. I think that that's correct. That's the way I would look at it. So then when you had agriculture, now you have a very different system. And this didn't occur all at once. It occurred gradually and occurred differently in different parts of the world. But ultimately what happens when you have agriculture is you have ownership of the land. In most parts of the world, that ownership of the land became male ownership. (laughs) Men own the land. Women became subordinate in ways that they weren't subordinate in hunter-gatherer cultures. Women contributed just as much as men did to the economy. Women contributed to the discussions and so on and so forth. And now one of the things that happens with agriculture is it's, you're capable of producing more food than you could before, which means that you can have more children. Hunter-gatherers don't have a lot of children. Part of the reason for that is the hunting and gathering way of life and the fact that the mothers nurse their babies until three or four years old in many cases. And when you're nursing and you're a lean, muscular hunter-gatherer woman, you stop menstruating, you stop ovulating for that period of time. And so babies are spread out much wow. more than they are in a 
in the farming culture where now you're, you've got more body fat, you're more sedentary, and you're not nursing your babies for so long, you're feeding them other things, then have more children. And with more children, there's more mouths to feed. You need now to do more farming to feed those mouths. You also begin to develop the idea of wealth and accumulation of wealth. You begin to develop the idea that, that I can be wealthier than other people. And you then here's the really key thing happens. I can increase my wealth. I can increase the number of children I have. I can increase my status in the world if I can get people to work for me. <laughs> So at some point, at some point, all the land is taken up. So now you've got landowners who the own feudal the property, system, mm. and you've got other people who don't own property, and they are dependent on the ones who own the property. So now you've got a system of bosses and employees, or worse, masters and slaves. So this changes the understanding of the nature of human relationships. It also changes the nature of parenting. Now, once you have a world like this, once you have a hierarchical world, there are some within the family, the husband is the boss, the father is the boss. Within the larger society, especially as we got to real feudalism, you know, the king or the lords, the manor are the boss. The goal of child raising becomes not to, not to support the child's will, but to suppress it to teach the child obedience. Obedience becomes the primary lesson of good parenting. And I, and I say good parenting advisedly because it's valuable to suppress the child's will in a world where willfulness could get you killed. <laughs> mm -hmm. That becomes a selected behavioral trait. That becomes a culturally selected behavioral trait. That's right. So children are naturally willful because throughout human history, will was valued. Will was mm. how you live. That was how. So the, the biology doesn't change that rapidly. So everybody, you're born with these willful kids. They want to do what they want to do. They want to play. They want to explore. They, they say, no, I don't want to do what you want to do. But in this new world, saying no saying, I'm not going to do what you want to do is dangerous. <laughs> mm -hmm. You could get killed for it. Mm -hmm. So you have to train that out of your child. And how do you do it? You beat them. You beat them for not obeying. Children naturally want to play and all those hunter-gatherer things were fun to play at. But hoeing and weeding and working in the field, uh, that's not necessarily fun. You may have to make your child do it. They don't necessarily do that voluntarily. So again, beating is the way to make them do it if you can't get them to do it in some other way. So the educational tool became the cane or the whip or the paddle, you know, whatever you want to think of it as. And beating became, I mean, you know, I, I hope this doesn't defend anybody, but read the Bible. And if you were to look through the Bible for how to raise children, the message you would hear over and over again is beat them. <laughs> this was the message at that time in history that these things were written. That was the understanding. The view came about as religions developed to, to sort of religions tend to follow the economic system. So we developed this hierarchical idea of religion where God is the Lord of all lords, right? And the task of the person is to obey God, right? That's the human task is to obey God. And secondarily, under God, we're obeying the king or we're obeying the local priest. We have this whole hierarchical system. And so it's not too surprising that part of the philosophy that emerged from the religions of this time was that free will is the playground of the devil. <laughs> that when we allow children to do what they want to do, the devil is controlling the child. And the goal now is to prevent the child from following what they want to do. So obedience becomes the primary lesson of parenting. Now, the reason I'm emphasizing this is this is where schools began. <laughs> So it was really in the really beginning as early as the 15th and but more especially in the 16th century in the 1500s with the Protestant Reformation were really the first 
schools for large numbers of people. And they were Protestant run schools. And the reason these came out of the Protestant movement was because the Protestants believed, as the Catholics did, but even more so, that, uh, that children need to be taught to obey, but they also believed that children need to be taught to read. And the reason they need to be taught to read is because the Protestants, unlike the Catholics, believed you had to get the word of God directly by reading the Bible. <laughs> And so schools developed for the purpose of teaching children to read so they could read the Bible, but even more than that, teaching them that the Bible is doctrine, that you have to believe the Bible. And as part of that, and even in some sense more, more than that, teaching them that obedience to authority is essential. The ultimate authority is God, but the schoolmaster is sort of part of God that's working right with you right now. Your father at home is part of God that's working with you there. You've got to obey the authority figures who represent this hierarchy down from God. That was what those early schools were all about. The lessons were very clear. The lessons and, and the methods that we still use in school were developed then. The method of imparting information to the children and the children having to repeat it back over and over again. The method of using extrinsic reward and punishment, but then primarily punishment in the form still now of beating. <laughs> we we're already used to the idea of beating children at home, but now in schools, children were being beat, not just for misbehavior, not just for acting up or being naughty, but for not learning their lesson, they're beaten. So that's the, that's, the method of, that's the method that was developed. And if you read the writings of the people who developed these early schools, it was very clear that the primary lesson is obedience. Important to teach children how to read. If you can teach them some other things that are useful, that's all very good. But if you haven't taught them obedience, you haven't done your job. <laughs> mm. So schools were started, they were they particularly flourished in Prussia, the German state of Prussia, or that, that was where they were most early developed. And this was also where they were first taken over by the state. In the past, in the research I've done, there is something called the Prussian education system. And we hear about the population was educated, but the Prussian government wanted to take the population to war against Napoleon. And because they were educated with the trivium and the quadrivium, the population was able to use critical thinking to say, well, no, we don't want to go to war, right? And I think Napoleon won that war. And the Prussian government said, we are never, ever letting that happen ever again. And created the Prussian education system, which was an inversion of what it was previously. I don't know the, the full background. And then that was the way to keep critical thinking away from the masses. And that system was adopted throughout the West. I mean, what's your take on that? I think there is something to that. I, I'm not so much aware of the specific thing that you're describing about. I do know that Napoleon was a big advocate of public schooling because it was how he would train soldiers. And the same thing was true in Prussia at some point. But what happened in Prussia with the king, I forget which king it was, but it was really at the very end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century, that the schools were taken over by the kingdom. And they became yeah. state-run schools, but they used the same methods. <laughs> but now the doctrine was no longer religious doctrine. It was the secular doctrine of the state which had really as you know, the German language is the best language in the world. The German people are the best people in the world. We're surrounded by enemies. This was now state doctrine and the rapid adoption of this school system in other places was at least partly motivated by that, by mm. generating patriots, nationalism, people willing to fight for their country. That was a big part of it. And it's no surprise that dictators have always been the biggest supporters of schooling. Stalin was a huge supporter of school. He could mold 
I can mold children to my will. You know, Hitler developed these youth <laughs> training centers to mold. You had to send your child to to Hitler Youth. That they would. This is to mold. So that was that was part of the history of of schooling. But and in in the United States, it was a little bit different from that. So in the United States, the first schools in the United States, just as in Prussia, beginning about the same time as we were still colonies, the New England colonies began to have Protestant-run schools. The book that children would learn to read from was, was colloquially called The Little Bible of New England. It basically had these little ditties and stories of, of how, about how if you lie, you'll go to hell and burn forever. About, you know, that you learned the alphabet by these, you know, Adam starting with Adam and going on to Zacharias and so on. And, and each one gave you a little, a little Bible lesson. They were basically religious training and training to read so people could read the Bible. In the, in the middle of the 19th century, Massachusetts, the state I live in here in the United States, became the first state to have state compulsory education. So the state began to require that all children of a certain age go to school. And from then on, for the next 50 or 60 years, more and more states in the United States began to require schooling. If you look at why these requirements were being made in the United States, you look at the arguments that were being made. First of all, Horace Mann, who was the first Secretary of State in the United States, the Secretary of State in Massachusetts, who was really initiated compulsory education in Massachusetts, where it was first initiated, he actually was a studied the Prussian system. And he said, this is a wonderful system. <laughs> we need to, we need to yeah. really learn from that and do this. We need to require children to go to this. We can't just, we can't just go on voluntary because not all the parents are going to send them. We need to be able to find parents or put them in prison if they don't send them to school. And if you read the, if you read the writings of him and others who were advocating compulsory education, a lot of it was based on the idea it, it, a somewhat more mild form of nationalism. We need to turn children into Americans. <laughs> this is a, was especially true given as we began to get a lot of immigrants from other countries. There was really fear of immigrants. There was fear that they would have different ideas, that we wouldn't have an, a unified national identity. So the way we create the national identity is we require all the children of all the immigrants and everybody else to go to school. <laughs> we even require the American Indians, we, even if we have to snatch their children away from them, <laughs> to go to American type schools so they'll become, instead of be Indians, they'll be American citizens. <laughs> We're going to make them do this. <laughs> this is how we mold the country. And some of them, you know, they were idealists in a certain sense. They really believed in this idea that we have to mold an American. And so that was a big part of the, of the founding of schools. Now, as schools went on and kind of continuing this history, early on, corporal punishment was still very, very common in school. It gradually became less common. First of all, I mean, a couple of things happened. One is, in the early days, the schoolmasters were met. <laughs> And as time went on, they became more and more often women were teachers. This, the principal remained the man. <laughs> and he'd be the one you would send the child to for a beating. But the, but the school, this, so you had this kind of softer approach in the school, partly because there were more women involved and women were taking the women are tend to be more gentle and tend to be more loving on average than men, at least historically, at least whether how much of that is biological and how much is cultural is up to argument. But that, so that had an effect. And so we gradually began to do away with corporal punishment. But then how did we motivate children to do the things that we felt they needed to do to learn what we, for whatever reason, believe they needed to learn? we began to use psychological means of punishing instead of physical means. I'm not sure this was an improvement, <laughs> but we began, <laughs> we began anxiety, shame, competition, who's best. You know, the world that you describe, which it seems as if one of the biggest turning points in human history was the agricultural revolution. Yeah, we went from free range humans to 
plantation yeah. humans. Basically, it's the it's the story of slavery, isn't it, from the beginning, you know, until where we are we're at now. And it seems the slavers, the people who are running these slave operations, have to adapt their means of control when the people have periods where they rise up and new rights or privileges are are fought and won against these people who are trying to impose their slavery upon us. And like you were, I pointed out there, it's, which there's been a progression of less physical violence because people ultimately push back against that. And now it's gone to a much more insidious and sneaky type of violence, which is mental violence. And, you know, I think that's where we're moving to now, isn't it? From the cane to the chemical kosh. That's what we're finding is kind of an epidemic in uh, public schooling at the moment. Yeah, I think that's right. And the thing that has happened over my lifetime, which is a considerable period of time, is that the school has become a bigger and bigger part of children's lives with every decade. So when I was in school in the 1950s, the school year in America was five weeks shorter than it is today. The school day was shorter than it is today. We had no homework in elementary school whatsoever. Parents were generally not involved in what happens in school. They were maybe had to sign report cards, but that was it. They were unexpected to monitor homework. They weren't being constantly called in to, you know, what happened in school happened in school. And when you were out of school, you were out of school. So when I grew up, I often say that I had two educations. I had school. But the bigger education was what I call the hunter-gatherer education. I spent more time, and so did my colleagues. I wasn't unique. So did the other kids. I spent more time outdoors playing away from adults, following my own interests along with other kids than I spent in school. That was typical at that time in the 1950s. That's why it wasn't, it's not the school was better, but there was less of it that, than there is today. Yeah, I'm 45, and I feel as if I was at the the one of the last generations to get the hunter gatherer lifestyle because that was similar to, to me. You know, we'd go to school, you'd go home, you'd throw your bag on the hook, you'd throw your coat, you get changed, and you'd run back out the door, and then you would play out with your friends in the street when you'd be free to roam until it was time for dinner or for bed, and your parents would give you a call and you'd go back in. And that was, you know, my childhood right. and it was fantastic. It was great. It was like you say, if you were going to have to spend the first part of the day in the prison camp, at least you got some playtime when you were yeah. left free. But my son doesn't have the same freedom. It's like, it's almost like an archaic memory to hear about kids going out after school and going and playing in the street. It just seems like it doesn't happen anymore. And I know you use this term about the, the walls of the school are extended into the neighborhood rather than just being where they were. That's right. So we've developed kind of what I sometimes call a schoolish approach to child raising. We have sort of developed the view that school and schooling, whether it's in literally in school or outside of school is how children grow, how children learn. So even when they're not in school, they are often in some sense in school. They may be doing homework at home. Hmm. Parents are being taught. It, 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 it's, it's not just your job to care for your child and love your child and feed your child and clothe your child. You're also supposed to be teaching your child, right? So it, even little infants are being subjected hmm. to teaching by parents who are believe as part of their job to do this. And moreover, instead of just going out to play your own game, your own pickup game of whatever it is you play and, and, and running around the neighborhood and doing the things that kids do, you're far more likely to be out there in some adult directed sporting activity or some other kind of adult directed activity, which is sometimes that's called play, but that's not play mm. and any meaningful definition of play as an activity that children are initiating themselves and controlling themselves and so on. That's really very school-like. 
one more situation where adults are in charge, they're telling children what to do, they're solving the children's problems for them, they're judging whether the children are doing it right or wrong, they're providing, you know, there's some even some stress involved, do I make the team or not make the team? If, since scores are being kept and, and trophies are being won, if I mess up, I angry i'm i'm anxious about it that's very different from play so children are increasingly in this situation where they are more or less constantly in competitive or semi-competitive activities being judged by adults and that's a very anxiety provoking condition and so it's no surprise that anxiety is through the roof it's massive, as is depression, which yeah. also goes along with anxiety. As you know, it's kind of like you can be anxious so long and then you just collapse. And depression, suicide, the rate of suicides among school aged children in the United States is now six times what it was in what it was in the 1950s. I mean, that should be warning signs enough, shouldn't it? That something is very, very, very wrong if children Absolutely. are killing themselves. I mean, what right. are the what other red flags do you need other than other than those themselves. I mean, and, and yeah, I think we, we can see this background noise of anxiety that pervades all aspects of, of society at the moment, isn't it? Everyone's kind of anxious about something, you know? Right, exactly. Mm. And, and interestingly, the most anxious people in America are high school age students. They're more anxious than adults are. We talk, anxiety is high among adults, but anxiety is highest among kids. The American Psychological Association did a poll called Stress in America a few years ago, and they found that high school age kids are, by their measures, the most stressed out, anxious group of people in the United States. 83% of them attribute their anxiety to school. Mm -hmm. Do you read about this in the popular press? No, you don't. Everybody wants to attribute it to the anxiety to anything else. It's like there's a taboo about saying that school is the problem here. Mm. I mean, it's kind of maybe it's a taboo for the reason being that if parents don't want to send their children to school, the options are quite limited unless you do a lot of research yourself and look for answers. But also as well is that now that both parents have to be sent to work in order to sustain a family, you know, who's going to mind the kids if you don't send them to school? And in some senses, you know, we talk about how women being sent to work was just to generate more tax. But I think is also it's about being able to capture the children because if you want a good worker or if you want a good drone or whatever it is that the state is trying to create, you have to do it with the children, don't you? There's no good once they've grown up. So, so yeah, I think it's... It's a taboo because there is no solution, really, is there? Unless you go and do things like self-directed schools, homeschooling, but, you know, if you're working full-time or even worse, you're a single-parent family, what can you do? Yeah, I think this is, this is part of the reason, I think, why, um, part of the reason why children are not out playing as much. So when I was a kid, maybe even when you were a kid, there were more moms at home. And as a consequence, people in the neighborhood knew one another, the, the parents knew one another, the kids knew one another. You knew that your neighbor wasn't a child molester because you knew your neighbor, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we don't, are less likely to know our neighbors. It's not just that moms are not home, dads, used to be home more than they were too. They'd be out working in the yard and the, and the on weekends or after school. Or they'd be, you'd have neighborhood friends and that made a big difference. So that's part of it. It's also part of it if there's nobody home when the kids come home from school and it, as there's been increased generation of, of fear about the, about the belief that it's dangerous for kids to be alone, either at home or outdoors in the public, because we're so afraid of, of strangers or whatever it is we think is going to be damaging to our kids in that situation. So therefore, we want to put our kids into formal activities during that period instead of just letting them play as we did in the past. You know, the whole movement, of course, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a big supporter of the fact that women today can work because the truth of the matter is that before women were able to have well-paying jobs and careers, they were dependent on men. And the result of that, there was a lot of battered spouses. 
who couldn't get out of a marriage because of the fact that they're economically dependent on the man. And so, um, so the feminist movement and the whole movement that made it easier for women to get jobs and, and acceptable for women to get jobs was, was from that point of view, a very valuable movement. But we never figured out what to do about the kids. <laughs> you know, we just didn't, that just got shoved under the table. What are we going to do about kids? And, um, and I think there are good solutions, but the solution, but we haven't taken those good solutions. What we've done is just put them in more, more time in school, more school-like activities. Yeah. And one of your key areas of research, which you're probably one of the world leaders in, is this idea of what a real education is. I mean, what is education? And you highlight two areas that are important, which is play and curiosity. That curiosity is the way that we acquire knowledge and play is the way that we acquire skills. Tell us a little bit about, you know, your research into those areas, because you know, one of the main tenets of your research is that children do not need adult intervention in order to educate themselves and learn the skills they need in order to tackle life as adults. And a lot of people can resist that idea, you know, due to conditioning. I know I did at first. I, know I was like, mm, I'm not sure about this. I think he needs my guidance and blah, 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 blah. And maybe that was just my ego or also my conditioning, right? And it took me a little bit of time to Look at the data, look, read the, the, the literature and go, actually, this, this is quite persuasive. So tell us a little bit about that and how you became persuaded of that truth too. Yeah, I think that, I think to begin to think along this line, you have to start by thinking, so what do we really mean by education? What do, if we say somebody's educated, what do we really want to mean by that? So normally when people think of education, they think of schooling. So they think you've learned all that stuff that was taught in school. That's the mark of you being educated. You've gone through all these lessons. You've got these various degrees. You've got a certain amount. That's education. So when you say that, well, if my child isn't forced to do all that, they're not going to become educated. There's a certain sense in which that's true. They're not going to learn all that stuff <laughs> that was being that is being taught in school. They're not. The truth of the matter is even those who are learn, supposedly learning that stuff, forget 95% of it by the time they're adults anyway, often by the by within a week after they've taken the test on it, they've have gotten I've taught in college a long time and I know this is true. If you if you were to give the same test a couple of months later, <laughs> you know, after you people go. studied for it, then yeah. it's gone. Right. Mm -hmm. So but so we have this notion of what education is. Oh, my God, I never would have learned quadratic equations if I hadn't been forced to do it. But would there be any loss if you didn't learn quadratic equations if you hadn't been? And wouldn't it be possible for you to learn quadratic equations now at age 45 if you suddenly discovered you needed quadratic equations? Of course you could learn it. So, that, so you've got to rethink what you mean by education. So my definition of education is this, that education is everything that a person learns that enables them to live a satisfying and meaningful and moral life. And when I, I ask people to stop and think, isn't that what we all want for our children? We want them to live a satisfying life, a meaningful life. We want them to be able to support themselves. We want them to be happy in their own skin. And we want them to be good people. <laughs> we want them to contribute more to the world than they take. Okay, isn't that what we want? So if that's the definition of education, I would argue that very little of your education or my education came from school. Very little of anybody's education. It came from life itself. It came from following our own interests. It came from the things that we decided we wanted to learn. And it came yeah. from just the, just pure living, just pure dealing with the realities of the world that we're growing up in. Very little of our real education came from school. And if we had all that time that school is taking up, we'd have even more time for this real education. So now to get to what your point is, so I, I talk about what I, what I call a biological theory of education, and that is that children come into the world with certain instinctive drives, 
which came about by natural selection for the purpose of education. I actually have a list a number of those drives when I talk in full about this, but the two first ones are the ones you mentioned, curiosity and playfulness. So all children are curious. They're born curious. Children are already exploring the world from within hours after their birth, after they're already looking around. As soon as their eyes can fix, there's actually research showing that if you if you show a child who's just a few hours old, you show them a particular pattern that they can see, and now you give them a choice between looking at that pattern and a new one, they look more at the new one. They're already saying, okay, I got some sense of that, but what about this one over here? They're not consciously saying that, but they're acting as if they're trying to figure out this world that they've just entered. And as, as babies begin to grow older and they can grasp things and they put things in their mouths. They're exploring everything they can get to. As soon as they can move, why are they moving? They're moving to get to things, to explore. They're, we have to baby-proof our house because they want to get into everything. What would happen if I <laughs> dropped this base on the floor? What would happen if I suck a bobby pin in this electric outlet? You know, we, we, they're yeah. not being naughty. They're being curious. They're trying to, they want to know they want to understand everything around them. And that curiosity doesn't stop unless we kill it. And my argument is we kill it in school. We kill it in school, in our typical schools, because in school, the things that you're curious about, the things that you, the questions you want to answer are disruptive. Yeah. <laughs> like, that you can't be curious in school. You have to do what you are told to do. Once in a while, by chance, something that you're curious about becomes part of the lesson, or you become curious about something that is part of the lesson. But no way is that going to happen most of the time for most of the kids. So necessarily, curiosity is quashed in school. For most people, it isn't totally killed. You still, if you have time out of school, you can exercise your curiosity. But if you don't have time out of school, you're always in school-like activities. As is so true today, it's hard to maintain that curiosity. By the time you're an adult, you may, you may no longer be a curious individual. That has been kind of washed out of your, out of your whole personality, your whole being. So that, so that's, so curiosity is how children are designed to find out about things in the world. And they find out they're, they're especially curious about other people. They want to watch other people, see what they're doing. They want to be able to do what other, what do other people know? Your children will learn more by overhearing you talk with other adults than they will when you're talking to them, trying to teach them something. Because they're curious about, everybody loves the eavesdrop, but they're curious about what adults do and talk about. And so they're paying attention to that. So that's curiosity. And then the other great drive the children are born with is to play. Anthropologists have shown that children all over the world who have ample opportunity to play, including hunter-gatherer children, play in at all the kinds of skills that human beings everywhere have to learn, and in addition to that, play at the particular skills that are important to their culture. So children play at physicals, running around, climbing trees. We have physical bodies. That's how they develop their physical bodies. They play at building things. We have posable thumbs. We're the animal designed to build things. They play fantasy games, imaginary games. We're the animal capable of imagination. Hypothetical reasoning comes from imagination, and children are constantly practicing that at play. We play games with rules where the animal has to live by rules. Children practice playing with, with rules. Most of all, children want to play with other children. We're social beings. We have to know how to get along with our peers, and children learn that through play. Children are biologically designed to play at all of the kinds of skills that human beings everywhere have to learn, including also language. They play at language. And in addition, biologically inclined to look around, see what people do, especially the successful people in our culture, and incorporate that into play. But to do all this, they need lots of time for it. They need not just an hour a day. They need lots of time for it. And we in today's world are not providing the time they need for it. So the, so the reason that children at a Sudbury School, of, school for Self-Directed Education or children who are homeschooled by the method of unschooling, the reason that they become educated is because they have ample time to explore, to play, to find out what they love to do. 
Hey, just a reminder, if you're sick of YouTube's adverts and who isn't, then please consider a subscription to our Locals community where I post all of my podcasts without any ads. And I'll also be creating exclusive content in the future that you won't get on YouTube. As a supporter, you can contribute to the community through our live feeds and make your thoughts known. And at the very least, you'll be supporting the channel. Locals is a great free speech platform for independent content creators. Head over there today and take advantage of the one month's free access using the coupon in the description. Join our community and get truth unfiltered. Now, back to the action. So, so we kind of like took a, a quick path through the various revolutions, you know, from the agricultural to the industrial, you know, now to the digital revolution. And during each of those phases, it became an evolutionary advantage to behave how the slavers wanted you to behave, if you like. When it was in the field, you know, you had to be beaten to do chores that you wouldn't do if you had a choice. Then we moved into the factories, you know, and again, it was violence that kept us down. And now into this digital age where the walls of the school have, you know, entered to the neighborhood. And it seems children now are with, with play, real play, having been reduced much more than what it was when we were children, is that they're still trying to find ways to get that, live that will, you know, live that desire they need. And one of those ways is through the screen because it seems in the digital revolution is that the culture is shaping our reality through the screen, whether that be the computer screen, the TV screen, the phone screen, and children are drawn quite you know, readily to the screen. And I, as a parent, get anxious over the time spent on it. But it seems as if to get ahead in this culture, you need to be able to manipulate the information that's coming through the screen. And, and I'm torn between, do we take it off him completely? Do we give him? The, is he on the clock? I mean, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on screen time? You know, because I know that's a really big topic with parents at the moment is what the hell do we do with these screens? Yeah, that, everybody seems to be concerned about that. I think that in some sense, the screens are the saving grace for children. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> screens are what have saved children's world because we've deprived them of the opportunity to get together with other kids in reality. We don't allow them out to play. Kids need to get away from adults. They need to be able to play and explore in their own kinds of ways. And the only way that we are currently allowing them to do that is on screens. So children play video games. They interact by social media. They interact the way you and I are interacting right now on screens, right? We can't get together physically to do yeah. this, but this is our second best, right? It'd be nice <laughs> if we were there in person in the same room, but this is a second best. There is research showing that children who play video games are doing better in the world than children who don't play video games. And I think one of the reasons that's true is that children, if you're not playing video games, there's quite a likelihood you're not playing much at all because this is how children play these days. We're not allowing them to play in other ways. We're not, re not real play away from adults. There is a study, for example, by uh, the University, Columbia University in conjunction with a number of European universities conducted a major study of children between the age of six and 11, looking at how much time they were spending playing video games. And then independently of that, through teachers' assessments, assessing their academic standing, their social abilities, their emotional control, and so on, on every single measure, those who are playing at least five hours a week of video games scored higher than those who are not, who are playing less than five hours a week of video games. That was kind of the tipping point at which they were looking at in this study. So to me, that's not surprising. If play, this is real play, playing video games is real play. Interacting on social media is real social interaction. <laughs> it's not, it's, it's in my mind, not as valuable as you can get to get together. There was a major study done a few years ago by, I'm not thinking of the name of the, of the person who did the study, but she wrote a book on it. It was originally a doctoral dissertation in which she interviewed hundreds of teenagers across the nation about why they're on social media so much. And the basic answer she got is that's the only way we can get together. I'd love to get together with my friends in person, 
But if I can go out there, they can't go out. <laughs> you know, yeah. it used to be, you know, when when even when when my own son was a kid who's who's a little bit older than you are, he, you know, this was a time when you'd find gangs of teenagers hanging out in the shopping malls. I was one of them. Yeah, I was one of you them. Don't, yeah. You don't find them anymore. No. And it's partly because the parents aren't letting them out, but also because the shopping mall security guards aren't letting them in. <laughs> mm. So we don't allow children. We don't allow children to interact in reality and that's there's no space people, for them to go and we meet criticize them for being on social media <laughs> you yeah. know it's like so i think it's the saving grace there's also a lot of research that i've looked mostly into video games but there's a lot of research showing that video games are building intelligence like no other activity does. They, the kinds of skills being dealt, there are by now dozens of studies showing that the kinds of, of skills that are being measured by IQ tests are built through, are built by video games better than anything else you could do. Well, uh, what's interesting about video games is that it, it is a, a massive problem solving tasks, isn't it? And quite Absolutely. complex co problem solving tasks. And I was one of the first generations to begin video games. And I had the very first one that came out, which is the Atari 2600. And we used to play Pac-Man and Pong and stuff and developed right through the the gaming right. hierarchy and you know i got to a certain age and i just said that's enough games for me i moved on to more real games for adults you know right, or more right. real play for adults but yeah it, it but it seems now that video gaming is quite pervasive and you get a little bit worried about you know your child will they become addicted will they be unable to let the game go when adult life calls them to go and do adult things and, and it's kind of a concern and but i like what you're saying is that it's it's a saving grace and it has the many positives as maybe some negatives too yeah well i think that you can that anything that we like to do can become something that we do at the expense of other things. And I wouldn't say that video games, this is any more true for video games than anything else. The only reason it is, is ha happens to be that video games are kind of the hobby of most kids today because it's a hobby that they're allowed to be involved in and it's a way yeah. that they can communicate with other kids. You know, there's actually the World Health Organization developed supposedly a, a way of diagnosing video game addiction. And I took that test for myself, but, it, <laughs> but I imagined myself in my, as an 11 year old, when I was 11 years old, I was into fishing. I was out fishing as much as I possibly could. Every minute that I could be fishing, I was fishing. I dreamed about fishing. I skipped school sometimes for fishing. I get up before, well, the idea was I was going to fish before school, but if they were really biting, I might stay long. <laughs> so this was, so fish, so I took this, except I substituted fishing. There's no question, but I was addicted to fishing by that, mm. by that test. <laughs> mm. I dreamed about fishing. This is regarded as pathological. If you're dreaming about video games, I dreamed about fishing. Don't we all kind of dream about things that we're fascinated with, uh, you know? So, so the only difference is that it was fishing. It was outdoors. It was, you know, this is video games. It could, you know, I don't think there's any real difference except that when I was a kid, some of us were into fishing, some of us were into kite flying, some of us were into this or that. We were all, we had lots of options. Mm -hmm. Kids don't have those options today. So they're all into video games. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and one of the things that is observed at the Sudbury Model Schools, where there's nice outdoor space, there's always kids outdoors playing, there's trees to climb, there's a pond to fish in or to float boats in, there's interesting things to do, and there are always kids around who are interested in doing those things. One thing we observe is, yes, there's a lot of playing of video games, but there's also a lot else. And people aren't just playing video games because the menu is expanded. What we need to do, what our, our knee-jerk reaction as parents in this world today is let's restrain what our kids can do. <laughs> We've already restrained them from going out and play. So now they're on video games and worried about, let's restrain them from that. <laughs> That's yeah. the wrong attitude. What yeah. we've got to think about is let's expand that menu. The kids who play, so there are some kids, there are some graduates of Sudbury Valley, there are some graduates of unschooling who say, and their parents say, 
primarily what this person did growing up was to play video games and to do things. Maybe they were making YouTubes. They were doing things on the screen. Now they've got a great job, <laughs> not necessarily as a video game creator, <laughs> but when I interview those people in these studies, they talk about skills they developed that are quite applicable to running a business, quite mm -hmm. applicable to the things that they're doing, that they develop real skills through these computer activity, including social skills. So I'm not saying that this, vi this visual world that we have, this, this digital world that we have is ideal in excess, but it's a good substitute. It's a, it's the best substitute that we're offering kids. And I, I, I made the point earlier that children, maybe I didn't make the point in exactly these terms, but anthropologists have pointed out that in every society that you look at, children are attracted to whatever is the primary tool of that culture. And they play with that tool and become good at it. This is very adaptive. So hunter-gatherer kids play with bows and arrows and digging sticks and knives and fire. Agricultural children play with agricultural instruments. If you come into this world today, very clearly the primary tool of our culture is the computer. Yep. No matter what you're going to do in this world, you're going to be involved with computers. So of course children are attracted to computers from that point of view. Every child is going and to deprive children of playing with computers is to deprive them of early on becoming skilled, making personal the primary tool that they're going to have to be familiar with as they're growing up. That, that, that gives me so much uh, pleasure to hear that. It really does. I can feel my anxiety levels reducing just <laughs> as you were speaking it, you know, because <laughs> it really is. I mean, that's one thing as a parent of a child who is homeschooled, right, is that you can get anxious about, am I doing it right? Is there a timetable? Should he be doing this by this day? Should he be doing that by that day? And that in itself can create a fear-based parenting or it can create anxiety in how you deal with it. So finding out about your work and self-directed schools and about the innate ability of children, you know, that we can just trust them. It's such relaxing, liberating, and a chilling effect, you know, which was, was really good. I really thank you for it, you know. I think the biggest challenge for parents today really is to, is how do we find ways that our children can play outdoors away from us with other children? That's the chat. That's a real challenge because outdoor play is valuable <laughs> and we want more of that. But how do we, how do we find, how do we create that opportunity for our children? That's hard to do today. Well, that's, that's fundamentally what my son's, that's called a self-directed community. It's not school. I called it a school. It's not self-directed community. And that's all they do there. They just go and they play. The parents go in another part of the, the the space and they just chat and the kids just go and play with no adults and at first I was a bit like are you sure about that don't they need a little bit of direction here what about a bit of coaching what about a bit of teaching you know <laughs> um no just leave them let them be and yeah that's so, great that's the kind of just. thing we need more of and more opportunity for more parents to be able to do that where you can just trust that the children are going to be okay they can play that's safe enough mm -hmm. you don't have to be there telling them what to do, solving their problems for them. Because the whole purpose of play, not the whole purpose, but a big part of the purpose of play is for children to learn how to solve their own problems without mm -hmm. some adult stepping in and doing it for them. My son came home recently and we were just chatting and playing and, and I don't spend enough time in, in the environment and I'm going to start up spending more of it. And he said something to me, he went, Dad, you're judging me. <laughs> <laughs> He's only and I was like, what? <laughs> <And he> was <laughs> right. <laughs> I was judging him. <laughs> but anyway, so, so you know, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but at the same time, the situation we find ourselves in is quite, you know, it's a little bit depressing in terms of all conquering public schooling system in which our children are forced to go through these slave camps, basically, you know, they are slave camps in which the natural will is suppressed, their ability to play is suppressed, and they're lucky if they come out the other end 
you know, as well-balanced adults, you know, it's, it's a real challenge that we're putting our children to our pride and joy. And, and it, it might be difficult for people who are, are, you know, don't have many other options. And, but what we are seeing, which is positive and maybe comes as a result of some of the things we saw during the health crisis of the last three years is that there has been an unstoppable rise of homeschooling at least in the UK, maybe in America, but places like Germany and Croatia, it's illegal to homeschool. You know, that tells you something in itself, doesn't it? But there seems to be this unstoppable rise of homeschooling. And I'm wondering where that's going to lead because either it will reach a tipping point where more and more and more people are doing that and the scales tip in our favor away from the public schooling system or the government step in and stop this crazy idea of uh, educating your children. Well, not ed or educating your children in, in a sense. I mean, what's your perspective as somebody who is right in the middle of this entire situation? What's your view on this unstoppable rise of homeschooling that we see at the moment? I think that this is how a lot of people for years and years have been talking about the revolution to come <laughs> in education, and it has not come so far. I think this is the revolution, and I think it's going to accelerate. I think what has happened is that school, the school system, by increasing its pressure, by doing it with younger and younger children, by it has it is burning itself out. It's burning kids out, and by virtue of burning kids out, it's burning itself out more and more parents. It used to be originally in the United States, the primary reason for homeschooling originally was for religious purposes. People in the United States, the fundamentalist religious families would homeschool. In fact, the legal grounds for it was freedom of religion at that time because they wanted to, they wanted to give a religious education and they felt that the things being taught in school countered their religious beliefs. So that was the original, that was the thing that really led homeschooling to be legal in the United States. But, but once you were allowing it for religious purposes, it became difficult to deny it to people mm -hmm. who wanted to do it for other reasons. Now, I believe the primary reason, in fact, there's some data indicating that, so the primary reason for homeschooling your kids is not for religious reasons. It's not even because you think that you can give your kids a better education in the sense of teaching them the stuff that would be taught in school normally. That's also true for some families. I think the primary reason is that people are seeing that their children are being damaged in school. Mm. They're seeing their child come home unhappy. So that's our reason, child, no, but I wouldn't send them in there for those reasons, you know? Yeah, they're seeing their child miserable there's maybe their child has been given a diagnosis and, and they're, they don't think, they think this diagnosis is a school problem rather than the child. They're being told that you should be giving your child this drug and that drug in order to, so they can adapt to school. 20% of boys in America are being diagnosed with ADHD at some point in their school and, and, and the parents are being asked to give them these powerful drugs. And so some parents say, no, this is, a, a, I'm not going to do this. There's too much evidence that this is damaging. It takes away my child's spirit and so on and so forth. Lot reasons like that in increasing number. Before COVID, there was already a gradual rise over years in homeschooling. It reached about 5% of American school children were being homeschooled. A year after COVID, that had increased to 11%. And that, that, that did not count people who were doing public school at home. These were people who had actually withdrawn their child from the public school system, legally declared themselves homeschoolers. I don't know if that is beginning to go down as school has become, as we've gone past COVID, but I, I don't know of any official data on it yet, but the reports from homeschooling associations and the reports from a couple of states that have done surveys is that most of those people who took their kids out of school during COVID are keeping them out. They're not staying going back. Homeschool. Yeah. So a lot of people discovered homeschooling during that period. And they people who didn't believe they could do it have learned that they could do it and are beginning to do it. Now, what happens when you've got more and more people doing it is that it becomes easier to do. 
you can do things like if there are other people in your neighborhood doing it, you, you can form the kind of play club that your child is involved in, the kind of opportunities. You can get together. You don't necessarily have to have one parent home all the time. You could have a system where the kids are being watched by different parents on different days, or maybe you've got a grandparent there who can who can sort of monitor the kids during the day and, and a bunch of kids, not just their own grandchildren, but, but there's a lot of things that can happen. One of the things that I'm interested in, I've actually got an article coming out soon in the American Journal of Play on this, is the idea of libraries, public libraries becoming centers for self-directed education. There are more public libraries providing services, especially for homeschoolers during school hours. There are more and more public libraries. In the United States, a large number of public libraries still have maker spaces in them. You could go and build things. You don't have to have an adult there with you. You can just go and build, build things. And kids are, kids are doing this kind of, some libraries are instituting free play at the library. I have this vision that as more and more people are homeschooling, they will become a political force within towns to say, let's spend a little less money on the schools since there's now less people going to the schools. Let's spend more money on the libraries <laughs> and let's have somebody at the library who can be there all day to kind of watch our kids while our mm -hmm. kids are at the library and let's build a, let's build gymnasiums in the library. Let's put playgrounds in the library. Let's put all these things in the library. Let's have, let's have art supplies. Let's have basically this idea of turning libraries into into a learning centers where that can really satisfy the need for parents to have a place for their children to be, the need for children to be where there's a lot of other children, a lot of interesting things to do. That's the way I see the revolution occurring. Yeah, sounds good. I mean, what, what will the, I mean, you know, there'll be resistance from the slavers if there's not enough slaves being produced to push the buttons and pull the levers of, of the property empire. You know, how do we counter that in a sense? You know, what are they going to do if, if there's less, less people, you know, on the plantation? There's bit, that's the biggest threat. And, and my understanding is even in the UK, there's a movement to have more restrictions on homeschooling, more monitoring and testing and that kind of thing. And that's one way to mm. reduce it. And, and many, there are places in Europe where you can't have homeschooling. There are places in Europe where you can have homeschooling, but basically you've got to prove that the kids are learning the same curriculum at the same time as they would in school. Well, that undermines the whole point of homeschooling. Not the whole point, but a big part of the point of homeschooling, which is to let the kids learn in their own ways at their own time and to learn what they want to learn and what they most need to learn. So I agree. And, and, I, and I, I think that this is where we need to place our vigilance. We need to keep homeschooling legal. We need to keep homeschooling free. We need to put the emphasis on the idea that families need to be trusted. Who's in, who should be in charge of the child, the state or the parents? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Basically, that's it. Now, I think there are places where you do need the state to step in. There really, truly are abusive parents. There really, truly are. That's true. But let's focus on what we really mean by abuse. And let's not say that because your child isn't learning the state curriculum, that's somehow child neg negligence or child abuse. But there's, a, there's an argument that's being made that that's child negligence all in itself as if your child isn't learning the state determined curriculum. That's where we really need to place our effort to keep the freedom of homeschooling and the freedom of parents to decide on the manner of homeschooling to keep that and to and to allow that to happen where it can happen. I think that as more and more people are doing it, they're being louder and louder, mm. more f force for it. I think in the United States, we're already at the point where it would be very difficult to provide greater limits on homeschooling. I think that there are enough people doing it that there would be real, real protests and that any politician arguing for this would lose a lot of ground as a result of it, that the voices for more educational freedom, if not more numerous, are louder than the voices for less educational freedom. Mm -hmm. But I do, I mean, a lot of the problem is our schooling system employs a lot of people. <laughs> There's a lot of self-interest in maintaining it as it is.
a lot of self-interest even in expanding it. Every solution, so with quotation marks around it to the problem, <laughs> involves more adults, more money. So for example, in the United States, we now have the situation where something like 30% of students are suffering from a mental disorder as diagnosed by, diagnosable by the typical system. Outrageous that that's true. Instead of understanding that this is because of what school is doing and we need to change what school is doing, we need to decrease the pressure of tests, we need to give children more time to play, we need to give children time to be real children, that this is that the school is the cause. <laughs> Instead, what we're doing is we're spending more money hiring therapists. <laughs> mm -hmm. So schools are hiring therapists. It's as if the school won't admit that the school is the problem. The child is the problem. The child has this anxiety problem and we need a therapist to help the child with the anxiety so that they can do school. Our solutions are solutions that are providing financial benefits to somebody. And that's one of the reasons those solutions get pushed. Central power gains more power through more centralization. So they're never, ever going to give it up, are they? And it seems as if it's one big trauma system is to traumatize children. So they become traumatized adults so that, you know, they're easy to control and they're easy to manipulate because there's a lot of damage going on in them schools. That's for sure. Yeah. And I don't think this is conscious. I don't think anybody's saying let's traumatize children so we could do, you know, I don't think it's happening at that kind of conscious level. But it's happening because so we keep increasing school because we because somebody believes it's good for children. And also, once you have this idea, then, oh, this is going to be a whole new course and we need new teachers for this. And now the people who are teaching this are pushing this because then they can teach it or We've got all this anxiety and now we need to help the kids with anxiety. And I think it's a genuine concern for help. But then once you have this, then of course the therapists are pushing this. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we, we therapists, we know how to deal with this. Let's, let's say we need more therapists. We need more money for schools to hire therapists mm -hmm. or the drugs that will help people do better on tests. Let's, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, of course, are pushing this and the pharmaceutical companies in the United States are also under they are paying the parents. So there are these parent groups that are all in favor of more treatment for ADHD and are saying, you know, this is a real thing and it's affecting so many people and more kids need to be diagnosed and treated. Turns out that they are, that their organizations are sponsored by drug companies. That's not publicly advertised, but they're getting their money for this from drug companies. That doesn't mean the parents are doing it cynically. They really believe in it. They think that this is all, that this is really the salvation for the children, but the drug companies are what's making that organization possible. So there's a lot of, you know, in a capitalist world, think, you know, giving children more freedom is free. <laughs> It doesn't free it doesn't in both sense. <laughs> it doesn't cost anything. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's benefiting financially from it. Mm -hmm. Giving them more therapy, giving them more drugs, giving them yet a new course. We've got the generation now in the United States of courses in social emotional learning. Well, the best way for social emotional learning to occur is for children to play with one another. That's the natural mm -hmm. way in which they learn all that stuff. But no, we have courses in it where they're being taught. <laughs> certain principles and they're practicing certain social skills and of course now this is a whole new specialty and there are teachers who are going to be teaching this they're paid for it. the people who develop the programs are paid for it i'm not necessarily against those courses but it isn't isn't it interesting that instead of saying let's have more recess let's have more free play let's have shorter school hours let's have more time after school for children to play because that's how they develop the social emotional skills that they're missing. That's how they overcome anxiety. We're hiring somebody who's going to give them procedures for dealing with their anxiety. Mm. Mm. Nothing exceeds like excess, does it? You know, so, so moving towards the, you know, the final part of the podcast, it's kind of like I work in all well, this podcast is in kind of the free th uh, freedom and truth movement. You know, we try to shine a light on various parts of um, the world that need light shining upon it. And there's a lot of people within this, this arena, you know, they talk a good game, right? They talk a good game, but then they send their kids off to the slave camp. 
you know, so what's, what's good for them is not good for the children, you know, so I think, I hope that this podcast can get through to more people and if they're inspired or, you know, they've been thinking about homeschooling, but don't know where to start and, you know, how would you advise somebody who is watching this and they're ready to go to the next stage of either taking the kid out or, you know, moving towards more play. I mean, what, what's your prescription for people looking to, you know, find solutions in their lives? I think an early step needs to be to find other people who are doing these things. Talk with them. There are organizations, there are homeschool, many homeschooling organizations, contact them. There are in the United States, if you're interested in self-directed education, we have the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. That the purpose, one of the purposes of which is to bring people together, have workshops where you're meeting other people. You're thinking about doing this and now you have the opportunity to meet other people who are doing it. We're talking about the journey they've taken and how they've taken it. Find out who else is doing this in your community and do they have do they have get togethers that you can visit and learn from them? It's very important when so we are all sort of creatures of norms. It's very different for us to do something that's different from what our neighbors are doing. I did a study some years ago of families that are unschooling. Gina Riley is my colleague on this, and I did this study. And it was mostly moms who responded, 275 families. And one of our questions was, what was the biggest difficulty of taking this move? And the biggest difficulty is not what many people would expect. Having your kids all day home, having, you know, being able financially to manage it without both parents working. These are the things we kind of expected would be the problem. The biggest difficulty was dealing with yeah. the social disapproval yeah. of what you're doing. And that social disapproval can come from your own parents, the kids' mm. grandparents mm. who say, you're just absolutely ruining my grandchildren. Mm. <laughs> you know, the neighbors, it can come from your best friends who are saying, what are you doing? Mm. <laughs> it can come from, so you are being, you are being confronted with this normative view and you may have doubts in yourself. You went to school. There's this schoolish mind in your own head that leads you to question what you're doing. The only way you can overcome this is by finding a new group who will help support, socially support a new set of norms <laughs> and a group that you can trust because they've been doing this a while where they've got kids who are now grown up and they're just doing fine in the world. It helps reassure you. It helps you reassure the kids' grandparents. It helps you. You know, I hear from family after family saying, this was a huge struggle when the kids are little. Now that my child is the founder of this million dollar company, my, parent, my parents are okay with it. So the success, doesn't come until later, but you, you want to be able to point to them. You want to point, you know, here's a selfish thing for me to say, show them my book, Free to Learn, you know, mm -hmm. which, which is full of information about people who've done this kind of thing. Look at the research that's been done. So I think it's really important to, and you, and the, the uh, parents themselves need to go through a process of what some call de-schooling your own mind. So we are I know I have, I've had to do a process of de-schooling my own mind. I've had to admit exactly. that was wrong, which can be quite a difficult thing to do, you know? <laughs> exactly. You have to get over the idea that, so when you first start doing this, you sort of watch your child and, and, and you are judging your child, you know, you're, <laughs> you know, as, is my child learning to read? Is my child learning this or that? And you get anxious if that's not occurring. And you have to get over that. You have to realize that in self-directed education, they don't follow the school schedule. <laughs> Everybody learns to read. I have yet to meet a kid who's been in self-directed education who did not at some point learn, or a person who did not at some point learn to read. But they don't all learn to read at age six or seven or even eight. Some of them don't even learn to read until they're nine or 10 or 11. But eventually, 
they figure out, okay, it's time for me to read, and they start reading. In my experience, even kids who've been diagnosed with dyslexia learn how to read, and when they're ready to learn to read, and they're allowed their own ways of learning to read. I've done a little bit of research into this. I have, in my st first study of the graduates of Sudbury Valley, there were two of, the, two of the graduates who had been diagnosed with dyslexia before they came to Sudbury Valley. Both of them told me they learned how to read within a few months of being at the school. I asked them why, why they could read then. And they said, for the first time in my life, nobody cared if I could read. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> the yeah. pressure was off. <laughs> the pressure was off. Yeah. The it's, pressure, still... it's the pressure. It's the anxiety yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah. I think that's what's good about your research is, is you show that the child knows it's important. And if yeah. they want to manipulate the world better than they're currently doing, they know that they, okay, well, I've got to go and learn that because I'm getting right. feedback from the culture that that's what I need to do right. to be successful. Right. So some have learned to read when, so, you know, there is an interesting story. So one of, one of the, in one of my studies, one of the said, well, you know, my mother was reading to me the Harry Potter books, and but I got really interested in the book, and my <laughs> mother's voice would go, and she couldn't read to me to the end of the book, and so I got impatient. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm going to learn to read, and the first book she read was uh, Harry Potter, one of the Harry Potter books, you know? Uh, That's a uh, kind of typical story. Another one said that, so I would play these video games, but to play the video game, I had to there were certain words I had to be able to read. And I'd always ask my older brother to read it to me. And at some point he said, I'm sick and tired of reading. <laughs> and so, oh, hell, I'm going to have to learn how to read. If yeah. I'm going to keep playing these video games. Yeah. So people, some people learn, most kids learn how to read very naturally, very early on, but some of them don't learn to read. They just, they, they manage to do interesting things. It's only speaking read. and learning a language it must be harder than reading from a page. And we seem to do that with no, no tuition whatsoever, do we? We learn how to speak. If you think about it, learning to read is simple compared to learning to speak. And, and most kids learn to speak. They pretty much know the whole language yeah. by the time they're two or two and a half, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and reading is not that difficult. There are some kids, my son was one, who can read well before they're four years old by the time they're three and a half there are quite a number of kids and their brains aren't really any different the only difference is they got for whatever reason and who knows why they got interested in reading at some point they wanted to learn to read at some point it's not that the parents were drilling them or teaching them they just took control my son absolutely took control he there was a point at which Every time he saw a word, he'd say, what's that say? <laughs> you know, we used to carry him around when he was two years old in a backpack in New York City. His first word was exit. <laughs> you know? And he could read, what's that say? <laughs> and what's that say? And then he'd start pointing to cereal boxes in the morning. What's that say? And we'd read it to him. He was directing the whole thing. Of course, he was getting help from us, but it was help that he was demanding mm. from us mm. because he had decided I want to know how to read it, right? So good skill to learn was, early on, isn't it? At the age of two, <laughs> that, that that doesn't mean that every kid in that situation is going to get that interest. But is he still a big reader that, now? He's oh yeah, he's a huge reader. Uh. So you can't predict based on when they learn to read whether they're going to be big readers or not as they when they grow up. What I can say with some certainty is that when children learn to read by their own interest and because they want to read and they've never been forced to learn to read, they are far likely to be big readers as they grow up than if they've been forced to read. If you've been forced to read, you develop a certain distaste for yeah. reading. You think of reading as work. Mm -hmm. You think of reading, you, you never totally get over that pain about reading, that anxiety about reading. If you never had that, because you were never forced to read, you were never made anxious about not reading, then um, then your reading is just like any other enjoyable activity. But it's like if you're forced to do anything that you don't like or don't want to do, you will develop some form of aversion to it, you know, later in right. life, won't you? You'll just want to avoid it because, you know, you were forced to do it against your will. And if you're a willful person, You'll resent anybody who tries to suppress your will. You know, I know I do. <laughs> right. So, you know, when 
if people who are inspired by this conversation or they've read, you know, other stuff about homeschooling want to take their children out of state schooling, I mean, is that the riskiest part? Is that something they have to get right? Because I guess the state schools don't want to hand over the property that they're, you know, ultimately trying to earn money from in the future, do they? So I don't know how it works in the UK or in other countries, but in the United States, you just do it. You don't really have to, you don't really have to talk to anybody in the school about it. You just make the decision to do it. You, you let the local school board know that I'm homeschooling my child now. I think that the, the important preparation is that you know what you're getting into. You talk to other people, you feel comfortable enough about it that you're ready to do it, that you yourself as the parent aren't overly anxious about it, or at least you have ways of dealing with the anxiety <laughs> about it. It's also very important, by the way, to know that your child wants it. <laughs> mm. That we might think from the way we've been talking that every child wants it, right? Self-directed education means that you are in charge. You can decide whether you're going to school mm. or whether you're going to be home. And some cases, and then this is also true at Sudbury Valley, there are some kids who say, I want to go to school next year. Mm -hmm. My friends are in school. I'm curious about school. Yeah. I, I might be missing something by not going to school. Fine, go to school. And, and typically what happens, they go back to school for maybe a month, maybe a whole year. <laughs> and they say, okay, I'm not missing that much. I want to go back to where I was. Yeah. But it's really important that part of, Part of trusting your child is to trust them to really make that decision. You're not making mm. the decision for them. You are enabling them to make that decision. You can just Google Peter Gray Psychology Today. I've got about 210 essays there on these kinds of topics. If people are interested in any of my academic articles, and they're eminently readable, you don't have to know technological, technical, <laughs> academic <laughs> language to read them. I write pretty much the same no matter who I'm writing for, you can find my academic articles, many of them that are relevant to these topics, also on the author page of my Psychology Today blog. Just click my photo on any of the blogs and you get to the author page and the left-hand column are PDFs of many of my academic articles, including my studies of grown unschoolers, my studies of graduates of, of uh, Sudbury model schools. Some of my other research is quite relevant to this. My articles on the importance of play and children's development. So that's one, that's another way to find me. You can find me on Facebook. You can follow me on Facebook. There's often a lot of dialogue on Facebook, on my Facebook page. I post essays there that I've done. I repost essays there that I've done on Psychology Day. I repost links and then people have discussions about it there. So those are- And your book, Free to Learn, that's my on book is, Amazon? My book is entitled Free to Learn. Free to Learn is what it looks like. It's, uh, the subtitle is Why Unleashing the Instinct to Play Will Make Our Children Happier, More Self-Reliant, and Better Students for Life. It's been translated into 18 languages. So oh, if you're from some non-English speaking country, you can probably find it in your, in your language. Mm. Fantastic. And uh, Peter, have you got any final words for people at home who are, you know, their minds have been blown for, by this information? What, what are you, what's your final message for them? So I, it's, <laughs> there's so many possible final messages, but really, I suppose ultimately the final message is trust your kids, listen to your kids, trust your kids, respect your kids. And you'll probably do all right if you can do that. Peter Gray, thank you so much. It's been an honor. And you take care. You too. Bye-bye. It's been a pleasure. Wow, you made it to the end. A true supporter. Thank you. If you want to continue supporting our work and keep up to date on what we publish, then please subscribe to my free newsletter, which I will send out once or twice a week. It will contain an in-depth look at each episode of the podcast and I'll share my research with you so you can take what you've learned further down the rabbit hole. I'll also be writing about my personal journey, what I've learned and the things that can help you on yours. It will entertain, educate and hopefully make you laugh a little because God knows we need a little bit of fun in our lives. As always, links in the description below. So until next time, thanks for tuning in.